everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Sharon, and this is a channel that is dedicated to all things related to narcissism. All right, you guys, right off the rip, right at the beginning of this video, I have a confession to make. I have been cocky about my recovery from narcissistic abuse. Now, this wasn't something that I was conscious of. It was something I just believed to be true. So I had never thought, well, I'm better or I'm this. I never thought that. But what I did think was that I'm, I'm ready to live my best narc-free life. I don't have PTSD. I don't have flashbacks. I'm not constantly living in the past. Like, I am ready. I'm here. It's time to live. And I thought that I could just leave all that behind me. It wasn't a part of my life today. It, it, didn't, it didn't compute. It didn't go through. There was like some huge barrier. And I was living on the right side of that barrier. Then, as often happens to me, and this is something I actively pray about, about because this is a problem I have, I seem to need to learn lessons in the most painful way possible. I can't just have a little whisper or a little nudge. No, instead, I have to be hit by a semi, run over, flattened into the pavement. That's how I have to learn my lessons, and that's a painful way to learn lessons. So I want to talk a little bit today about what happened to me, what I realized about my own recovery, because it's kind of, a, not, I don't know if a warning is the right word, but just something to tuck away that, you know, maybe all of us still have little vulnerabilities here or there, little hairline cracks, and it's okay. It's okay to have that, but it's good to be aware of it. So you don't do what I did and just jump straight into the deep end and all of a sudden I'm getting pulled under. Something happened to me about a month ago that put me on a little bit of a, a, an ugly path. I started, I, I was going back to the way I was or the way I, I remembered with the narcissist and it wasn't a good feeling. So you guys know, just for those of you that don't though, my children and I, I have two children, 20 and 17, we are completely no contact with the ex. So he's not a part of our life at all. This is a separate video, but just it, if you are able to go no contact, I can't even tell you. Well, I can tell you. I'm going to tell you. I don't know why I said it like that. It's life transformative for us to be able to be narc free, to, to not have him in, the, in our life at all. It, it's so helpful. You know, and another thing I actually realized recently, some of you may know that Joe's maybe a little bit behind me when it comes to the recovery. And I realize why that is. Joe, actually, we were talking about this one day and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is why. Being completely no contact with the ex puts the, my kids and I on a different level. We are able, there, even though when you've been with a narcissist, I don't know that you can ever have closure, but when you go no contact, you have this point, this place where you can start from. It's not constantly pulled out from underneath you. No, you, you know where you're starting from. Maybe you're not starting from the best place, but there is a place you're starting from. In Joe's situation, even though he personally is no contact with his ex, his kids are not. And so this just, I don't know why this didn't occur to me, but all of a sudden, you know, I'm realizing that's the difference, you know, because for him, even though, like I said, he's no contact, but his kids, one of his kids lives with the narcissist. The other one is over there all the time. She lives, she literally moved recently, Joe's ex, 10 minutes from the house. So she's driving up and down the street, like Joe sees her car. She's in his life. He'll hear things about her from the kids and it puts him on a different level than where I am with my kids, you know, because we, we don't have that. That's not in our life. However, there was a little bit of time when that did come into our life and this set me off in a bad way. So the kids and I are no contact with my ex. However, once a week, by order of the court, he is allowed to send the kids an email. Now, he hasn't seen the kids for, oh, closing in on four years, but he, they do get this weekly email from him. By their own choice, they've decided they don't want anything to do with him, so they have the email blocked. Now, a blocked email is different than on a phone. Like if, if I block someone's phone number on my, on my phone, they could call me a hundred times a day and I wouldn't know. When it comes to a blocked email, the email goes to your junk. So you still get it. It goes to your junk and there's like a big red flag next to it. So you have to manually delete these emails. Well, about a month ago, Paris came downstairs, my daughter, and she said, can you read an email with me? Can you read this email? And it was from 
her father from the narcissist. Now, this particular email, you could see he, he so it, you know, see his name there. And then the headline of the email was in bold letters. So when she went to delete the emails or her junk emails, she read what it said. And it said, that guy is dead. So Paris came downstairs and she's like, can you please read this with me? And I'll tell you a little bit about that guy. That guy is her grandfather. So he just put this right in the title. She saw it. She was afraid to read the email. She, she didn't know what to do. So we read it together in the email, any email that we've read from my ex, it's always the same thing. They're about two sentences long. He just continues on the chain. You know, they don't reply. He just, it's just this long chain. And it always says something along the lines of something he's doing and call me. So I did this, blah, 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 call me. This one was very similar. It said, that guy is dead. He died on Friday. If you want to know more, call me. So Paris and I are sitting there and we're looking at each other and it was very awkward. It was just weird. We're sitting there on the bed, just staring. And then she said to me, and she's like, am I supposed to feel something? Because I don't feel upset. Like, what am I supposed to do? Are we, are we sad? Like, she's like, I don't, I literally don't know what to feel. So I'm sitting there and I, I it was the same for me because it was just what? It was unexpected news, right? It was unexpected news. Um, I didn't expect this to happen. She didn't expect this. And all of a sudden, like the way she found out too, it was just, it was, it was a bad moment. So we talked about it and we're like, well, you know what? We, we prayed for him. We prayed for him. And then Paris is like, I guess we'll just go about our day. And I, I agreed. Like, what else were we going to do? It was, it was just, it was weird when that happened. She hasn't seen her grandparents for four years. They were never close anyways. And I'll tell you the story of why he's called that guy. You know, I come, uh, I come from a family, my ex does too, where as far back as I can see on both sides, it is narcissists and codependents. And I'm sure a lot of you are, have a similar experience. You know, that's what we're surrounded with. That's what we know. That's what's normal. That's why a lot of the time how we ended up with a narcissist to begin with, it, it's all we know that is, that is a relationship. So it goes back as far, you know, as I can on both sides. My ex's father though, now my own father, my ex, they're narcissists too, but they're covert narcissists. So they're the type of narcissist where, you know, if when you meet them, you know, oh, he's such a great guy. Oh, they're so great. You know that Satan emerges when you're at home with the narcissist, but out in public, they are the greatest guy, the greatest girl, just such a great person. My ex's father was not like that. He, I call him sometimes the grand Puba of narcissists. He was outright, nobody would meet this guy without thinking this something really wrong with this guy. He is not a nice person. He's obnoxious. That's how he was. Now, what had happened with him though, is he was very successful at business. He was very wealthy. He had a lot of businesses. He had a lot of acquaintances. So because of that, he did have somewhat of a social life. You know, if he was only a jerk and, you know, was working a regular nine to five type job, he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have had what he has in life. But there he was. So you would not meet him without knowing, geez, this guy's kind of aggressive. The stories I would hear about him at work, like there's, I don't, today, this would never happen. He would be taking phones and throwing them across the room, kicking computers over. Like this is what he's bragging about what he was doing at work. He also had the rather unfortunate quality of when we would be together with him. So say we were over their house eating dinner, he would encourage his grandchildren, my kids, to insult their grandmother. So he would say things like, hey, Paris, tell your grandmother that she looks really fat today. Hey, Paris, tell your grandmother that she looks like a dog. Ha ha ha. You know, like he thought this was fantastic. I never allowed, you know, my kids never said that to their grandmother, but it really, really upset me and it didn't want the kids around that. I talked to my ex and I was like, you have got to say something to your father. Like I would say stuff, but you know, I was just the daughter-in-law. So I would say things like, oh, come on, don't do that. No, don't say that, honey. Like that type of thing. But I wanted my, my husband at the time to tell his father, you can't do that. 
But because he was the grand poobah, everybody was afraid of him. Even my own father said to me one time, he was like, listen, never get on his bad side. You will regret it. And part when I left my ex, I was on his bad side and he was involved with trying to get me arrested. But these, this was other, that, that's for another story. My whole point here is that he was a flaming narcissist. He wasn't a nice person and he wasn't close to his grandchildren. My two kids are his only grandchildren. He would see them on average. Now, they, we used to all live in Massachusetts, not together, but in different houses. But, you know, we all lived in the state together. We saw them more often then, but not that often. They and they moved a while ago. I think the kids are maybe, I think Paris is five or six. So my youngest would have been around three. Around that age, they moved um, to Florida. So they've lived in Florida since then. And we would see them about one time a year. So this wasn't a close relationship at all. But it was still her grandfather, both, you know, both my kids' grandfather. So one time when my daughter was about three or so, her grandmother came over to babysit and she brought the narcissist, her husband, with her. And when they left, my daughter said, so Paris said, you can bring that guy again if you want. So she didn't know it was her grandfather. It was her grandmother's friend, that guy is, is how she looked at him. That unfortunate name stuck. And so he was always that guy. You know, they used to think, and we haven't sp spoken to them in years, but prior to that, oh, we could shorten it to TG. You know, it was one of those things that just stuck. So that guy is her grandfather. They're not close, but it's still her grandfather. And so it would just, it was, it was weird. It was just, I don't know. I felt, the, and then the thing is, and this is where I'm kind of going into my recovery. I do think I'm at a good place in my recovery, but I think all of us can be vulnerable, you know, because when this first happened, when I first found out that he passed away, I I was conflicted, you know, I had conflicted feelings. Then I started to get, I don't want to say sorrowful, but I was upset because I'm a Christian and I believed that he could be in hell. So I'm sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, like, what if he's in hell? And I didn't want him to be in hell. So I was praying for him. I was praying for him. You know, I asked God if if, if he was to, to help him, you know, I, I was praying for him. And as time went on, I started feeling probably the best way for me to describe this is loss. Not loss of him, not loss of, of my old life. I, I would never want to go back there. But I felt like there was an unfairness, you know, like, my kids, the the only grandchildren, shouldn't they have a role in this? Shouldn't this matter? You know, shouldn't family be more than this? And then I started feeling bad for myself. And I was thinking, you know what? How come nobody took my side when this whole thing happened? Everyone knew the things that my ex had done. My whole family knew. It wasn't like they didn't know. They knew. And I was still encouraged to stay with the narcissist. And I think that's a problem a lot of us have. Like I said earlier, when you come from a long line of codependents and narcissists, if you are the codependent, you have a role. Your role is under any and all circumstances, you will put up with the behavior of the narcissist. You will not say one word. You will shut up and you get in your place, your rightful place at the end of the line. You know, I used to think sometimes, um, this is a little bit off subject, but just because I was just thinking of it now, I used to wonder when I was still with my ex, I was like, you know, I wonder if when my mother and my mother-in-law pass away, am I going to move up in ranks? Like, does that happen? Do you move up? And now like my big goal could be, oh my gosh, now they're gone. I am the, the matriarch of this family. That means I can boss around my own daughter and my daughter-in-law, and then they can't say anything about it because I'm above them. This is like a little side thing I'd, I'd often wonder. Now, I'll never know, sadly. But, um, you know, so I started thinking this, and I started feeling the loss and anger about things that had happened. And all of a sudden, I was in like a different place. And so I was talking to Joe about it, and Joe had just this epiphany when it came to it. And it just, this is like the whole point of the video he was like Sharon you took your armor off doesn't God tell us and he does in Ephesians 6 11 to 13 put on the whole armor of God that you may be you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil once Joe said that and I was like damn you're right that's exactly what happened I was getting cocky. I was thinking, all right, I'm at a better place. Like I'm, I'm not the way that I was. I'm in a, a new place. I'm healed. I did it. I've recovered. 
not realizing that that so if I if I get stay at that point and I take off all my armor I'm vulnerable and I think it's a reminder for all of us so Joe really helped me out when he said that because it was just like I was smacked across the face with the reality oh my gosh that is what happened we can't take off our armor when you're dealing with a narcissist you know I believe that when you're dealing with a narcissist you are dealing with somebody that is evil that they're doing the will of satan whether they know it or not that that you are against a real enemy and god tells us keep your armor on and remember there's no armor for your back your back you're not supposed to turn your back on anything bad you're supposed to go full force keep the armor on and it's a reminder that you can really be taken down if you take that armor off, if you believe, you know what, I'm done, it's over. All of us are going to be vulnerable for the, because of the things that have happened to us. It doesn't mean that we can't get through it or, or you know, quote unquote, get over it. But it does mean to be aware, be conscious that things can still happen when you least expect it. You know, you have a hairline fracture, something can get in there. You know, I heard before, that if you have a a, a, a a hole the size of like a dime in your house, a mouse can get in you have to plug that up. Little, little areas we, the narcissist can get in and they'll try to get in any way they can. So that happened to me and I wanted to talk about it and just a little warning that never take your guard down. It doesn't mean you have to be paranoid, but just be aware things can happen. You never know when they're going to happen keep your armor on. Thank you guys for listening. I'm going to try and have a second video come out this week. I'm trying to make a commitment that, okay, it's October. I've missed so many videos. I'm going to try to do two week. So look for that. I'm announcing this. I'm holding myself accountable. So I should have another one out this week. Thank you guys for being so patient with me as I've been going through stuff. I really appreciate it. I feel like I can come back. Like I'm ready to go. So hopefully I'm not fooling myself. Thank you guys for watching this video. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in a couple days. God bless you.